to the cloud. Say, well, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us for today's edition or this month's edition of Tech Talk Tuesday. We're excited to have you here. Um, this month, we are going to talk about media projects for the spring. And we have an awesome rock star teacher in the house. Andrea Rogers is here from Amsterdam Elementary in Manhattan, Montana. And we're really excited to have her join us and share her stories from her classroom and give you some great ideas for the spring. Um, I'll let my I'll let these two people introduce themselves. My name is Nikki Bradenberg, and I'm the director of education at Montana PBS. Um, I stepped into this role about four years ago, and before that, I was a kindergarten first grade teacher. I taught fourth and fifth grade for a little bit, and I taught for about 16 years. And now I get to teach teachers, which is super fun. Uh, Carrie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So um, I am Carrie Wardle. I'm the education manager at Idaho Public Television. So I do a lot of what Nikki does um, just in Idaho. I also am a classroom teacher. Uh, I taught fifth grade for um, 10 years before stepping away to now do the same kind of thing where I get to help um, teach teachers. And so I'm excited to, to be here and to share this fun uh, media making session with you today. All right, Andrea, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I am Andrea Rogers, and I teach fourth grade at Amsterdam Elementary School. This is my sixth year in the classroom, and I had the pleasure of working with Nikki for a few years in my classroom as a mentor and helping me learn how to integrate technology in really cool and fun ways. So I'm excited to share with you guys. Yeah, we, I tell Andrea stories all the time. It's really fun to have you um, on this today. Just yesterday in one of our other workshops, I shared about some of the work we did together. So without further ado, today we're going to talk about, you know, why would we do media projects? Why is the spring a good time for media projects? Andrea is going to share some green screen projects that you can do. I'm going to talk about stop motion and Carrie is going to share about coding projects. So um, Let's just throw it out for some discussion among the group here. You know, what is it about spring that makes doing projects like this, digital projects with students, um, worth doing? Why should we do it? Who wants to answer that? You know, I'll take a stab at that. I loved doing sort of those out of the box things um, in the spring after the state testing was done. Um, you know, my students, of course, I had fifth graders. And so as soon as the state testing was done, which was usually April, they thought they were finished, right? They didn't have to learn anymore. School was over. And so having activities where they actually still were learning and, um, but kind of those next level and sort of those out of the box things that we maybe didn't always have time for um, during the school year because of our curriculum. I loved to do those kinds of things in April and May um, because of that. And, the, and also I just think kids are you know, it, it helps to fight some of that sort of blah burnout that we always know happens in about April and May, I think of teachers and kids. So that's my thoughts. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think at this point in the school year, kids are, they're feeling that burnout. Um, it, at least at our school, we have really short spring breaks, two days here, two days there, but not really a full break for kids. And so I think by getting them engaged in some of these media products or projects, they're still engaged and they're excited about being here. And it kind of takes away from some of that burnout that Carrie was mentioning. Yeah, for me, especially working with younger kids for most of my career, I found my kids were cooking in the spring. Like we, we finally were at a place where we weren't um, going through procedures and routines and um, we were reading a little bit better and we the everything was everything just felt more alive in my classroom in the final three months of the school year um, and it and it felt more possible to do a little bit things that were a little bit more took more steps or maybe took more time um, and it was like like you both said it was a nice just break from the norm and giving them another way to show what they know. So those are, I think those are some good reasons. And I think now we'll be able to provide some really cool examples. Um, not that these projects couldn't be done in the fall or the winter, <laughs> but we, it's the spring. So we're talking about it for spring. 
So first up, Andrea, um, why don't, we'll let you take it away and, and talk about the green screen things. Awesome. So um, green screening is basically exactly what it says. It's just a technique to kind of layer images. Um, so you can take a picture and then layer it on top of a fake background scene if you'd like to. You can do this with um, just a normal photograph or if you wanted to do video presentations using the same technique, it's very possible and super easy to do. So what I started off with was just telling you um, what you would need to do it. So you just need a green or blue background. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a green screen, but we before the, we had the green screen, we would just use dollar tablecloths from the dollar store. So it just has to be a solid green background or blue background. Um, and any camera device will work. So if you have tablets or Chromebooks or whatever your school uses for a device, they just need to be able to take a picture on it. Um, in our school, we use, we use Do Ink. It's connected to our iPads. It's really student friendly and easy to use. It makes layering the images very easy. Um, and then I've also read that WeVideo is another option um, depending on what your school uses. Some ideas on how you could use green screen in the classroom. So I've used it for writing projects, history projects, geography projects, and book talks. Um, I did a little Google search um, this week just to see how other teachers are using it. And literally the list goes on and on and on. Um, there are so many ideas. There are tons of Pinterest pages um, committed to showing different project ideas and different things for different age levels. So the examples I have today are showing you what I'm doing with my fourth grade students here in class. Um, the top two photos are two young ladies who did a writing project. And this is how I start my school year. Um, we work on fictional narratives. And so the first thing I have them do is to write their typical um, personal narrative, a story that's true that happened to them. And then we take it to the next level by adding fictional elements to it. And they get so excited because by this time in their schooling, they have written so many um, personal narratives that when we talk about it, there's just this huge sigh of hesitation. But then when we talk about what we get to do with the green screen by trying to really convince people that we were taking part in these fictional events, um, the kids get super excited and the engagement goes through the roof. So um, the young lady in the rainbow shirt, her story, her fictional narrative about her summer vacation was um, when she went to Florida and was surprised by a giant alligator. And um, the goal with these stories is we hang them in the hallway with our pictures and we post them to our Seesaw blog and their job is trying to convince their readers that these things actually happened. And the green screen images just take it to another level. Um, the young lady uh, inside of the book, her story um, this year was actually really cool because, because of COVID and um, a lot of people weren't traveling, she talked a lot about all the books that she read. And so her story was about her getting sucked into one of the books that was on her reading list this summer. And um, that was how she depicted her experience. And then the bottom three videos, this shows three kids doing a five clue challenge. And we actually do these in the springtime. So after we've studied um, all of our regions and our states, our students, like to create these five clue challenges and they crop themselves into a background. So that background works as one of their clues to where they're at and they give clues and they start off very vague and they get more detailed with each clue. And the point is to try to have the people who are watching the videos guess where they're at based on their clues. And the people that are watching the videos get to use Google to practice their Google searching. Um, and those are just three examples of my students and their five clue challenges. Should I show them? Sure, absolutely. See if they'll Welcome play. Welcome to my five clue challenge. I'm gonna give you five clues. You can pause your video um, throughout the clues so you can look it up. And my first clue is that it is a state. Um, my second clue is if you live in Montana, you would have to drive to it. I mean, not drive, fly to it. Um, my third clue is if you are there, you can probably swim with, dolph with dolphins. And it's okay with your parents. 
Um, my fourth clue is the state flower is yellow hibiscus. And my fifth and final clue is that um, it is surrounded by water. And if you haven't already guessed, it is Hawaii. I just got some a couple interesting facts. Um, there's the state bird is the I don't know how to pronounce it, pronounces, but it's Nina or something. Um, the islands are Naikawa, Kawaii, Ohio. Ah, never mind. Let's just stop there. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love that, Ohio. That's awesome. <laughs> it's just a really fun way to get kids excited about things that we're already learning to kind of um, reiterate some of the other things that we've learned in the past and uh, get them to, st to stay engaged at the end of the school year. Mm -hmm. I love how you tied that in with the five clue challenge um, thing. I know I've shared five clue challenge with teachers before. And I have teachers that are doing it, but I love that you tied in green screen um, with the five clue challenge. That's awesome. Thank you, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> I should say we, you know, we started by doing the five clue challenge with the kids a number of times. And if you haven't seen five clue challenge, um, Mike Soskill is a uh, national teacher of the year. And when you get to be teacher of the year, you spend um, a lot of time traveling to other locations to, for speaking engagements. And so he took advantage of that by recording his videos for his students, trying to get them to guess where he was and encourages research and discussion about around geography as mystery animal videos as well. Um, and so we watched, I think we spent a couple months when I came to visit, we did a five, five clue challenge every week. So they got really familiar with the format. Um, so then it was uh, fun for them to make their own. And I think we used Google Slides, right? To kind of organize what their clues were. Yes. And then finding the image and some of them got pretty fancy in that they edited it so that there were several images that showed up while they were giving their clues um, and then had the final image be the big reveal of where they right. were. Mm -hmm. And I love the ones that were different <laughs> to dress up to try to <laughs> act the part. Yeah, yeah, that's so, so great. These girls put on their winter Hello, coats. My name is Morgan and my name is Helen. And this is our five clue challenge. The first clue is that this place is located in Asia. Our second clue is we get a lot of snow here. The third clue is, is this place is over 60 million years old. Our fourth clue is we're in the Himalayas. And the fifth and final clue is that this is a well-known mountain. If you haven't all guessed it already, it's Mount Everest. That's so cute. <laughs> goosebumps watching them it's so fun and they have so much fun doing it and um I also think that it just it it's a project that all kids can participate in so it's differentiating within itself just because each student is going to pick something that is important to them and then their clues are going to sound different than their friends clues and everyone has an opportunity to just kind of showcase what they're capable of doing well and the amount of research that they had to do to find those clues is I mean the things that they were talking about I was like oh that's awesome so um, what a cool project yeah and the discussion about what's a, a an open-ended clue versus a really specific clue was interesting to listen to each group have too about what's what's an obvious one that we wouldn't give at the very beginning because we don't want them to get it in the first clue so there was there was a lot of strategy involved Right. That's cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Andrea, did you have anything to add about green screen? Welcome to my five clue challenge. No, I think that's it. Um, just I would encourage you to try it. It doesn't hurt to The first clue is Oh my gosh. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. As we learned how to do it, we um, figured out what worked for us and, and what didn't work. We made mistakes along the way, but we figured it out and the kids are amazing at troubleshooting and problem solving. And I think together it's just a really fun and easy project that any classroom could participate in. Mm -hmm. I agree. We can get to the next one. All right. So um, 
The one I wanted to share is Stop Motion Studio and Stop Motion Animation projects are something that I've done. I never did them in my own classroom. Um, I had teachers that I, when I stepped into this role, were interested in giving it a try. And so I've, I've been able to help teachers do this in their classroom. And basically Stop Motion Studio, it's a free app. Uh, there's some upgrade. You can purchase an upgraded version of it, but the free version works beautifully. It is a tablet, but it's also on Chromebooks as well. Um, and it allows you to just take a series of pictures and then the app stitches all of those pictures together into an animated video. Um, the the cat eater, I don't know how they say this, cat eater, <laughs> that's what it looks like. The website here um, is really great for giving some examples as well as giving some lesson plans. So what I've told teachers before, if you're not really sure how this might fit into what you're doing, they give you just a few pretty nice ideas about how you might be able to use stop motion in your student in your classroom. So for instance, this is a nice um, example. I think I can click on this. No, I thought I was, had a video that you could click on, but Nope, not so much. Or right, anyway, a nice example of erosion and having kids explain the concept of erosion using stop motion. I think this is the one I can click on. So they can use a combination of um, slides with words on them um, and then images as well to try and tell the story of a concept. Um, and this looks like basically just a regular old slideshow. Um, until you get to this part at the end where they actually demonstrate what erosion is. Yeah, we'll go back. So there's some lesson plans and all of these, they also provide some tips for the classroom um, and then gives you some uh, equipment and maybe a storyboard that you might wanna use. So a great place to start is this website for the Stop Motion Studio app. Um, and then they also have some video tutorials. So if you're looking for how to use it, you can find the video tutorials. Um, the, the lesson that I always show is this one. And this is from Becky Ayler, who was at the time a science teacher at Park High School in Livingston. And she invited me in to kind of help with her class while they worked on this project. And the assignment was for the kids to use stop motion to show the difference between fusion and fission. She left it very open-ended. They didn't have devices, so they used their phones. At that time, the school was allowing them to use their phones in the classroom. And they worked in groups. They started it on Monday and it had to be done by Friday. And they had you know, one class period. Their class periods were about 55 minutes, I think at that time. And it was really cool to walk around and see the creativity. The thing about stop motion is you need you need it to be a really steady shot because you're taking basically the same picture over and over again. Um, and you learn very quickly that your hand will shake or the light will come in or the shadows will mess up your pictures. So you can see where the kids, they've got a chair on a table and they've got the phone placed here on the chair. And then they've got their little workspace under there and they're taking pictures that way. Here they taped the phone to this box and they're using Play-Doh on a whiteboard to, to act out their scene. This group of girls went home and designed this cardboard piece and brought it back the next day. And they lay their phone over top. They've got the holes for the camera. And then all the work begins under here. And these are holes for their hands to like move things around. So, I mean, the design. Wow. Of just the tripod. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, it was really cool. I also loaned them my tripods. I had some real cheap $15 tripods from Amazon and brought those in and they found those to be really helpful. So I'll show you a couple. This is this one is by far the best. Vision. Film brought to you by Fuego Choose Production. <laughs> okay, let's pretend we have a neutron here, right here from space. Okay, sure. So it's coming in and it's flying real hot, just as a lone neutron. Bada boom, bada bing. Look at that. What is this down here? Oh, it's uranium. Uranium 235, perfectly stable, unlike my X's. Here comes the space neutron. Bada boom. 
whoa, what is this? It's uranium. Wait, but it's 236. That's not stable. Oh, one too many bean burritos. That's how I'm feeling too, man. There it goes. Wait, but hold on. Krypton 91. What? Rarium 142. Three neutrons. Okay, it explodes. Everything goes everywhere. Wait, but here's another neutron. Space neutron? Okay, sure. Here we go. Wait, but what's that? Uranium 235. It's a cycle. Fine. So you can see, awesome. yeah, so they take the pictures and then the, there is an audio recorder built into the app so they can audio record themselves talking. Um, I think Becky said for this one, he, he put it into iMovie and did the editing that way too. And so that's another option as well. Um, so that's, you know, your high school version. I also did it in, um, a kindergarten class and I went and visited. I had a kindergarten teacher I worked with weekly in Three Forks and I wanted to first demonstrate what stop motion was. So I made this one, um, which is just eating a Reese's peanut butter cup, which was super fun to make. And so then I let them eat a Reese's peanut butter cup and make their own to kind of just separate the pieces. Like how many pictures would we need to take to show the disappearance of the peanut butter cup? Um, and I always really recommend when we do projects like this, kind of putting the content to the side for a little bit so they have the opportunity to learn to use the tool with confidence um, and doing something fun like eating a peanut butter cup. Um, that's why I love my job because I'm the fun lady who comes in and puts the content to the side, lets them eat peanut butter cups <laughs> and make cool stop motion videos. Once we did that part, then we could have them stretch out words. And so this is my example video, but we had them make post-it notes and spell out the word cat. And so they had to write the letters of each word on a post-it note and then place them on the table and take a picture each time and then stretch out those sounds. For some reason, it doesn't want to play. But try to refresh and see if that works. Try that one again. No, that one doesn't want to go. So anyway, it just lays down the post-it C-A-T and then there's a picture of cat at the end. So that was um, an, another example of elementary school. So basically what we can do with stop motion is it really does work well to have kids tell a story, have kids demonstrate a concept. Um, I think the most popular stop motion involved Legos. Um, and letting kids set up things with Lego bricks and use their little mini figures. And um, a lot of the tutorials on YouTube about Stop Motion Studio have been made by children and they're demonstrating how to make their own little Lego scenes. And so what I always caution teachers is that's the first thing kids will wanna do is do Stop Motion Lego. And they'll start with the Lego movie, you know, they're going to do their own version of the Lego movie and maybe it's got like 10 scenes and it's got all this dialogue and they'll realize that every scene in the video is a picture and you would take a picture and then you're going to move your piece a little bit and then you're going to take your picture and then you're going to move your piece a little bit and take another picture and that takes a really long time <laughs> and it's easy for kids to burn out very quickly if with that vision in their head is way bigger than what they have the time to do or the patience to do. So that's where we really recommend storyboarding and having the kids really plan out what their what each picture will look like and and maybe limiting it to you're just going to tell a five picture story. So how can you tell your story in just five pictures um, and having them plan that out? You just you can take a piece of paper and fold it into squares and have them write in each square what their plan is going to be. And that will and it's just a quick sketch and that having that plan going into the project helps quite a bit. Um, you saw in the ones in Becky's classroom, they used a lot of clay and they used whiteboards. Um, another resource that I highly recommend, I don't think I linked it to these slides, but I'll just navigate to it real quick. If you go to um, PBS Learning Media and you put in stop motion, 
animation. There is a resource for stop motion animation that's part of the uh, media arts toolkit that was created by KET. This video is really nice. It's kind of long and it demonstrates kids using the app and talking about their process. And in this case, they were making a stop motion video about child labor. So they took a concept from history and had to tell about, tell facts about that time in history using stop motion. So you can get really broad and conceptual. Um, but then this over here in the support materials, there is um, in the support materials for students, there's some discussion questions. And I think right here, the activity has a nice lesson plan right here. And then it has, um, it, it connects to some lessons there and talks about animations and, and links to the standards and talks a little bit, has some clips and has some storytelling tips there. So you can find a little bit more, maybe it was here. Yeah, it kind of breaks it down here into the, into the lesson plan. So this, we'll put this in the resources on the slide too, um, that just provides a little bit more uh, structure for doing one of those lessons. So now I'm gonna kick it over to Carrie. And uh, Carrie, do you want me to stop sharing or what, did, what were you thinking? Yeah, well, um, I will share my screen here in a minute. Let me just give an intro and then I'll, I'll share okay. mine. Um, I'm going to kind of show you next level or leveling up, um, whatever with PBS kids, Scratch junior. So if you didn't know this, if you haven't seen any tech talks before now, I'm a total coding nerd. And in fact, I'm pretty sure we had a tech talk where I did an intro to coding to scratch junior. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, find that one in our YouTube channel and go watch it. Um, I love PBS kids, scratch junior. The thing that I love the most well, there's so many things that I always say I love the most about it. And then I find five other things, but what I really love about it is, you know, PBS advertises that it's for K to third, but I love that it is so simple that a kindergartner could do it, but there's also so many complex features that it keeps fifth and sixth graders entertained as well. And they can do it too. So that's probably one of my favorite things about it, you know, is there's not often things that will entertain kindergartners and sixth graders in the same app, right? Um, and so if you don't know what it is, PBS uh, Kids Scratch Junior is just a, it's a coding app. It is an app, so it is compatible with iPad and Android. It does work on some Chromebooks if your Chromebook will play, will has the Google Play Store. And most of the newer ones are coming with that standard now. So unless you have really old Chromebooks, it may not be compatible, but um, you actually download it through the Play Store and then play it on your Chromebook. Um, and so that's a possibility as well. And you can see just a quick screenshot here. It's a block coding app. So all you have to do to get it to run the code is snap blocks together, which is why kindergartners can use it. There's no reading involved. Um, and the PBS Kids version has PBS Kids characters in it that um, kids love to code with PBS Kids characters. But I want to show you um, some sort of next level things that I never really get to unless I do a really long training because, you know, most people need to know the basics first, right? And um, so I want to show you, I'm going to share my screen. And I wanna show you um, some cool things here. So give me a second. I never can remember how to do this on an iPad. Okay. Um, I have two screens going on over here, you guys. Uh, start, okay. Um, there it is, yay. Can you guys see that? Cool, okay, so this is my Scratch Junior um, my projects and I've done a few and I'll just show you a couple of the sort of next level ones that I've done and then I'll show you a couple quick little features of them. So whenever I introduce coding to kids, I feel like the most concrete thing that they can um, associate with coding is video games, right? And then I always talk about how, you know, when you push X or when you tap the screen, the character jumps, 
and that is somebody had to code it to do that. Inevitably, what they always want to do is make a video game, right? And so I thought we were going to make a video game. Um, and of course, then sometimes they're disappointed when we start with getting cat out of a tree, but whatever. So I actually made a, a just a short, quick little video game, but <laughs> I made it one time at a summer, like for a coding camp, I did a three week summer coding camp and um, the kids were fighting over um, how they got to play, if they got to play it. And then uh, some of the sixth graders in that camp um, tried to figure out how to create their own and I wouldn't let them see which blocks I used. And so they kept playing it to see what to do. So this little video game, and it's, it's the simplest little thing, but um, when I open up my screen, you can actually see there's a lot of code, but I'll just show you this. So the idea with this is that you tap the green flag and you don't let the rocket get hit by the planets. And I'm just tapping the rocket. Oh, now I just ran into a planet. I don't know if you can hear the sound, but it made the little and then it says you lose, press the green flag to play again. Now I should have said press the um, stop sign, but that was a really simple little game that I made and the kids loved it. And they would just play that forever because the goal is to try and get the rocket to the top of the screen without it touching a planet and getting blown up. Um, and so all you do is tap the rocket when it hits a planet, it blows up. So that's kind of some next level coding there. And you can see here that I have multiple lines of code um, on one character. So the rocket is coded to, um, you can see that first section there where the rocket's coded with a green flag and up arrow and to repeat that continuously. So it's just coded to move up forever. Then it's also coded um, that that shorter sort of second line of code um, is that if it bumps into a planet, it's coded to stop, spin. I added, and I'll show you um, that, but I added sound. I literally just found an explosion sound on my phone. I held the phone up to the microphone on the iPad. I hit play and it recorded the explosion sound. And, um, and that's how I got that, that explosion sound. So um, just a super quick thing. And then it, it pops that other thing up. And then it's also coded that when I tap it, it moves down. So that that way, when I was tapping it, um, it would move a little ways. So that one rocket has three separate lines of code. Some of them run simultaneously. And so this, this is where that's kind of that next level. Kids, you're used to just doing the one line of code for one object, but this has multiple. And then if you look at the planets, that code is really simple. It's just um, moving in a direction and repeating forever. And so this is a really simple little video game, but I, the kids loved it and they were super engaged and my son even, I mean, he thinks I'm pretty cool and he'll be like, mom, can I play your video game? He's seven um, and he loves to pop it up and play it. So uh, if nothing else, they'll think they're awesome after you do that. So um, I love that one. And again, I mean, there's so many things that you can add into this. Um, you could make them but there's a lot of pieces and parts. And this was so much trial and error, which I think is so good for kids to have to just try and try and try again. It looks pretty simple, but to get this rocket to do exactly what I wanted it to do and figuring out how to do three lines of code that would run at the same time, this, it was a lot of trial and error for me. And I remember, you know, at home sitting on the couch, like, oh, that didn't work and being a little bit frustrated, but I, I finally got it. Um, and so that's a skill that I think for kids is um, critical. So I love, I love the little video game. Um, this other one is um, <laughs> Nature Cat. This one's a little bit harder for you to, I'll just show you quickly to see without actually seeing it. This one uses send and receiving messages. And so um, if I tap on the sunlight, the flower grows. If I tap on the rain, the flower also grows because what do plants need to grow? 
sunlight and water, right? So we talk about that. And then if I tap on the little bunny, um, she goes over and eats the flower and then she grows bigger. This one involved some beginning blocks, some trigger blocks that not a lot of people use and they can get a little tricky because they're send and receive messages. And so you'll notice that on the sun, um, all I coded it was that when I tap it, it would send an orange message. And then if you look at the flower, see how it receives the orange message and it grows big, right? And so anyway, this, and you can see again, the flower has three, three four different messages that it can receive um, because each of these things sends it a different message. So the, the bunny sends it the message to disappear when it comes in contact with it. So this one, I'm gonna tell you, the sending and receiving messages is something that it takes a lot of work. It's a hard, um, it's a harder concept. It's really a next level for kids to, to fully get that, for some adults to fully get it too. Um, I've done this where I do um, an unplugged with the kids first and I literally make them hand each other envelopes um, that are closed in different colors and some that have messages and I make them hand it to the kid and I tell the kid, now you're receiving this message, do what's in the, what, you know, follows. And I, I have multiple kids hand each other messages. And we really talk about how like, okay, three kids could send you one message, right? And so when I did this in that summer camp with kid, with the kids, we spent probably two class periods um, just doing the unplugged version of this and having them literally write and sort of, you know, give messages to kids. And then we came in and I said, now here's the same thing, right? Um, and it went so much easier than, than other ones that I taught where I just tried to teach them to do it digitally. So um, I recommend that. And I just got envelopes and um, made uh, of different colors. And I didn't use exactly these colors, but I just found multicolored envelopes and used them so that the kids could understand. There's six choices. So one character could receive up to six different messages because there's six different colors of envelopes. Um, so that's another one that's next level. And then I'm, I'm not gonna show you another project, but I'm just gonna show you a couple of things quickly. Kids can, this obviously comes preloaded with backgrounds um, from the PBS Kids shows. It comes preloaded with characters from the PBS Kids shows. But in addition to that, um, kids can create their own characters so they can completely hand draw their own character or they can take pictures of themselves or their friends or whoever and they can make those be the characters in um, in the app as well. So I'm in the character, the adding a character, and I choose the blank one and I go to the paintbrush. And then you'll see on the right hand side there um, that there's a camera. And so if I tap that camera and then tap on the canvas here, the square, um, hello. Oh, I always forget this part. You need to insert a shape first. Sorry. Um, there we go. And then I could then put a picture of myself. So I would just, I'm just going to, yay, look at that. That's a, don't be amazed by my stellar picture right there. But um, you can see that I can now edit this so I could crop it down. I could color it. I could do whatever I want with it. Right. And I can even give it a name. So if I wanted to name this myself, um, I could do that and now I'm gonna put this super awesome picture of me. Now, clearly if I were doing this with kids, um, we would spend more time like kind of outlining it and making it actually look like a little bit more like a character. But I just wanted to show you that now I can put that picture in here and I can code it just like any other character. Um, and so I love that. Now I can do the same thing with backgrounds. So if I choose the blank background, Whoops, um, sorry you guys, my thing's breaking out over here. Choose the, bank, the blank background and the paintbrush, you'll notice the same thing, there's a camera. 
So if I tap on that camera and then tap on the screen, um, I can flip my camera. You guys, there's my dog, sorry, in the background. He um, got neutered today, so he's got the cone of shame. Um, <laughs> so I could then, this is my house, right? Which is actually pretty cool for kids to take a picture of their classroom or their house or whatever. So I could take a picture of that. And now that becomes my background um, on Scratch Junior. And again, I can color it, I can add it, but now I could, you know, take a picture of my dog if I wanted and I could code my dog in here. What I've seen um, some teachers do with this is a couple of things. Um, again, coding in your classroom is awesome, but I've seen them use it to have kids take pictures of um, like in a book that they're reading and use that as their background and then sort of narrate the book. Same thing with characters. Um, we use this to start helping my son. Uh, he has some special needs and I took a picture of a class of a hallway at a school and then we coded how he should appropriately um, act in the hallway and which is not running and not pushing it right and we started to code that. So um, anyway, I, I love this. And then there's also, you can add voice. So kids can record any sound that they want, excuse me, that they want. If you just hit that microphone, it allows you to record whatever you want and put that in. That's how I got that explosion sound in the game. Um, and I didn't actually record anything, but if I had, it would then add a block there. Uh, so then kids could do dialogue where they're talking back and forth with each other and they put that in and, and code their characters. So. I'm going to, I'm going to stop there, but there's a, and that's what I love about this is that I can give, I can have littles get on and do just the really basic stuff. And then I can get fifth and sixth graders on there and I can be like, all right, figure out how to create a video game, right. Or code and add voice and have dialogue back and forth. Um, and kind of kids at any level can do this. So those are, that was a really quick, um, <laughs> tutorial through there, but I just, I love it for its versatility. So I'm going to stop sharing Nikki so that we can um, go back. That was cool, Carrie. I have, I swear every time you do something with Scratch Junior, I'm like, oh, I didn't know it could do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I love it. There's so many things that I just don't think people realize they can do and and I'll even I even had a, a a fifth grade teacher that I was like I'll come do scratch junior and she was like eh. I mean I looked at it and I feel like it's for little kids and I was like trust me I taught fifth grade I teach coding I can do this and she was like okay and we went and I had them do a, you know that sort of higher level things and at the end she was like I'm doing this every year and um because she you know was skeptical because it's it looks like little kids um, stuff. So anyway, I love, I love the versatility. Mm -hmm. I took a lot of notes. I was writing as you were. <laughs> well, I was talking really fast. You're welcome to shoot me an email if you have questions or whatever, but, um, but it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun thing to play with and mm -hmm. find all those fun little. Yeah. Well, those are our, our media projects for today, and we're super excited that we got to share those things with you, and thanks for tuning in to Tech Talk Tuesday, and we'll see you next month. We have one more. One more? Are we doing one in, April, in May? I can't remember. We'll probably just do I April, right? I don't think so. Yeah, I think we're just doing April, because, you know, more. May is... Nobody wants to learn anything new. Who wants to learn anything new in May? <laughs> We've got our foot out the door. Yeah, that's right. And it's the fourth Tuesday in May, so nah, yeah, yeah. No, most people not, are. Nobody will. Nobody will be into it. So the, we'll have one more for this school year, and um, reach out if we can help you. I'm gonna.